I was going to talk to you today and give my testimony and tell you all about how God saved me from a life of drugs, motorcycle games, heavy drinking, fighting, and a lot of court appearances as well. But when I spoke to Pastor Samuel at work, and he told him the service was about the Holy Spirit, God put something up. Well, I knew I had to talk about it. No, not just talk about it. I felt I had to tell you. But no more than that, God has put it on my heart to tell you. He tells me through His Spirit how to communicate with God. And this is the most important thing and the most important lesson I've ever heard as a Christian. We're always asking, we're always asking God what we want. But we never listen to what we need. Mm. It is vital that we, I call it, opening the eye of my heart. An honesty and a bare truth, bearing one's soul, so to speak. God knows what you're going to think before you even say it and think it. But he wants that relationship with you. He wants that honesty. He wants that truth. Once he's got that, you have a whole sort of world relationship. Something that God can bring you. If I to describe God, our Father, in one word, it's quite simple. That word would be love. Plain and simple love. Now, seven years ago, before I was a Christian, life was hard and tough for me. I got a wife that was suffering bad with epilepsy, full malthesias. Is that better? Thank you. I got a wife that was suffering with epilepsy. Full, full mouth seizures, which means convulsions, contortions, lack of, not even breathing. But she only got these in the sleep. And with all the troubles I was having at work through one thing and another, but the boss put me to work regular nights. So you can understand my turmoil. I was about ready to quit this job. I remember riding a motorcycle into work one night, parking it in a loading bay, not even putting my overalls on. And I just sat on the pallet and rolled my great big fat joint with my arm, waiting for the boss to come so I could have this little stuff with him and walk out and go back to my life. Lovely. We can do this without the microphone if you want. I can speak it. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah, let's forget this, guys. I can do this. <laughs> so, to be honest, I sat on this pallet with a, with a joint in my mouth, smoking in a non-smoking area, waiting for the boss to come down so I could have my anger with him. Because don't forget, I'm not a Christian at this point, and I'm an angry man. I've got motorcycle gangs after me for drug money. I've got a drink problem as well. I've got a poorly wife, I've got a boss that doesn't like me, and the police are taking a really good interest with me in a couple of court cases pending. So I've got nothing to lose whatsoever. Mm. At this point, this is where God comes into my life. And I call myself an upside down Christian. Sorry, I'm going to... Sorry, I don't need to see you. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Yeah, cool. No, I don't need that. <laughs> So I call myself an upside down Christian. And the reason being is I witnessed or felt God's passion and spirit on me before I even turned to him. Which is very unusual because it says in the Bible, knock and the door will be open. I never even knocked. God came to me. And he came to me in the way of a Christian man called Rod. And I'd seen this man before he became a Christian. He was known at work as Raging Rod because everything was a big problem to him. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. Do you know who I am? And he was an arrogant person. But over time, being a Christian and giving his life to God, he turned himself around. And he came over to me while I sat on this pallet smoking this joint. And he says to me, Aunt, 
you're a worried and troubled man, I can help you. And to be honest, I was really rude to Rob. I really was rude. In no uncertain terms, I called him a Bible basher and go away. And I can't repeat what I called him. But he stood his ground and he made me a vow. And he said to me, Aunt, tell me the ten most things in your life that are troubling you. And in ten days, I will try and turn them round for you. Well, I was a desperate man. I've got nowhere else to turn to. My biker brothers, and I think you've got some pictures up there, if you'd like to turn it round for me. You've got a picture of Jake. If you'd like to put up, Jake was my fellow biker brother. And when I meet a biker brother, we'd stand back to back. We'd fight to the death for our, each other. We are, call ourselves brothers from different mothers. And don't get me wrong, this is before I'm a Christian, because I've got no family. I've got no security. The only good thing in my life was my lovely wife that stood by my side. So, Jake. Okay. Jake was my soulmate. We've been in many scrapes together. So, I told, told Rod about Jake and the problems we had and the trouble with the police and the motorcycle gangs and my wife's illness. And I bared my soul to him, what I call my soul. And at the end of the, this long discussion and talk, Rod says, right, I can sort this. I said, how are you going to sort this? I trust you're not going to pass that information on to anybody. I trust you with that. But how? And he says, I'll pray. Well, my jaw at the floor. You're going to pray? Don't sort anything. Words. Where's your God? Bring him down here now. Big puff of smoke, bolt of lightning, let me shake his hand and I'll do the deal. <laughs> but you want me to pray to someone I can't see, I can't hear, I can't touch? No, I don't think so, man. Mm. But Rob kept on chipping away, chipping away. And I was a desperate man. So that morning when I got home from work, I was in the shower and I looked up at the light fitment and I said, Lord, you're either there and you're going to answer me because I'm a desperate man. Or I'm talking to a big cute light fitting and I've had too many drugs. And I bear my soul and I call it opening the eye of my heart. And I believe when you're that honest and that open with Father God, he answers. Not ten days, not nine, not eight, not seven, not six. Four days later, hmm. I was put on to day shift so I could spend the night with my wife who was suffering. On the second day, the prayer team from a church in Derby called the CCD, Community Church Derby, where Rod went, knocked at my door to come and pray for my lovely wife, Debbie, for this epilepsy that she's had for years that no one can cure. I am the original Doubting Thomas. <laughs> I am, trust me. I welcome these people into my home and they stood around Debbie and I can see it in my mind and the picture in my mind today. She was knelt on the floor next to the coffee table and they all stood around her and they all held hands. And they asked me to join them. So I'm there, holding their hand. They're all praying. I'm not listening to the words. I've got one eye open, watching all these pages in my living room. What are they going to pinch? What's in it for them? Where's the catch? Because all my life, I've had to fight for what I got. All my life, I've had to struggle. And it was these, an the intimidation, the biggest lad, that got me out of trouble. I mean, what I can this. So, when they prayed, something different happened to me. They finished praying, they sat down, started drinking their cups of tea, and I was still stood there. I could feel my toes, I could feel my legs, but I could not move. Mm. I could not move. I didn't understand why. I was so shocked I couldn't speak. And this little old lady called Jean, June, sorry, 
touch me and says, Adam, sit down, sweetheart. And as soon as you touch me, I could move and I sat there. I just stood, sat there, mouth open. What has just happened? From that day on until now, Debbie has not had a full male seizure. And then, in 2000, back in 2000, this was. So, that started me thinking, there's more to this. There's more to this God than I can understand, but there's something there that I don't understand, but there's something there that works. The third day, I get a letter. The police have dropped the charges against me. And then, the third day. And I said, actually, at this time, I've got a, a, a mother that was in her nineties, suffering really badly. She got angina, cataracts, artificial hips. She'd already had cancer, had her breast removed, and she's in a bad way. And I've not been the best son. I didn't visit her every week in the old people's home. I didn't take her flowers. I was the one that was in the pub, the joint in the mouth, the beer, listening to some rock band, death metal, whatever it was, and riding a motorcycle like a stone my mum was taken to intensive care, and I'll never forget it, it was at a new Royal Hospital in Derby. And the doctor came out to me, and I feel so sorry for this doctor. He was an Indian doctor, for me. And he came out to me and says, Mr. Cole, your mother's not well. Would you want me to resuscitate her? At that point, I totally lost it. I didn't understand what the doctor was trying to tell me. I grabbed this doctor around the throat, pushed him up against the wall, and in no uncertain terms told him that if he didn't save my mother, he would be seeing his maker. <laughs> At that point, security arrived and obviously took me out of the building. But I never forget it, it was a lovely little Irish nurse that came out, a lovely one red hair. And I stood outside, ranting and raving, kicking my motorcycle, throwing my helmet around the car park. And she says, Mr. Cole, what the doctor was trying to say is it. he tried to resuscitate the mother. She is at the front of the original brain. The trauma and the shock had only come on the agony of a certain death anyway. And my heart sank and I realised what I'd done to this talented kid with the doctor. At that point, because I've been talking to Rob and been attending his church, I dropped to my knees. Picture this, outside the new hospital, a park where it says no parking, right outside the entrance where the big walking doors are, and I'm here. Lord God, help me! I'm asking you to save my mother. Lord, I'll do you in any deal you want. Just give me 12 to 18 months more than I'm on. Let me show it. What a good son I can Bless me with this Lord. Fourth day. Not only out of intensive care, Mum's back at home. <laughs> These are just a few ways that God started to speak to me. I went on the Alpha course, something I recommend for any young Christian. And I took my friend Jake, and they got get a picture of Jake with them. To say he's a bit of a rough diamond and a bit of a character is an understatement. He makes me look like a punk. He really does. He was a bit of a man. And we, he went to the Alpha course with me to prove me and God wrong. He went there, they went to answer the questions I find out. Because that's what Alpha's about. If you've got a question about the Lord, you want to know about Jesus, come to the Alpha course. We'll answer it all. His name, Rachel, in here. Yeah. And he says, puts his hand up, and he goes, Yes, Jake. He says, It says in the Bible that God doesn't condone homosexuality. He said, That's right, Jake. So, what would you do if you got two homosexuals walk through the door there? Hmm. And the pastor's jaw dropped a little bit. And the pastor leaned over to Jake, and I'll never forget the sense. And he says, the Lord hates sin, but he also forgives. He will forgive the sin, but he hates sin. He will make a heart. Mm. So Jacob is feeling. Next week, I have a better question. 
And the week after, the pastor answered his question. The week after that, the pastor answered his question. Till he came to the Holy Spirit. What a day. I don't know if you know the help of course at all, but towards the end of it, we have a Holy Spirit day. And if anybody wants to experience the Spirit of God, we encourage you to come forward. Well, I was the first one. I was like a rat out of trap. Who wants to experience God's Spirit? Me! Me, 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 me. Straight to the front. I was there, my arms out, my eyes shut. Lord, fill me with your Spirit. There's people around me, laying on the hands. Fifteen minutes I was there. Nothing. I was getting angry. Frustrated. Twelve weeks on this Alpha course. At least you can fill me with the Spirit of the Lord. The old ant was rising from the ashes. The nasty ant, I was getting angry. Not the Christian ant. So these people were very polite and said, so there's other people be praying over and move on. I keep the chair over in church. I'm off. So yeah, you can keep the church. I'm rubbish. <laughs> I went outside and I just popped a cigarette up. On the way back in, my good friend Rob and his friend Dave gesturing him. No, but I thought he just wanted me to move some tables and chairs because it was coming to the end of the course. But uh, he just put his hand forward and all I can remember is falling back. It seemed like he was in slow motion. It felt like I landed on a feather bed and it was a concrete floor. I counted to five and I brought myself to my feet. A bit wobbly and a bit dazed. And then all was smiling and clapping and praise me. He says, what do you mean praise me? And I was a bit weary. I think you realise you've been out for 35 minutes. Now they called it God's anaesthetic. And I believe that God takes out the bad. Oh, my knees were shaking, my body was shaking. I said, I've got to go outside, guys, get some fresh air and go for a cigarette. Still had a bad habit there. But when I opened the doors to the church, it was night time. And it had been raining. Everything up until that point looked like I was looking at through a TV. Remember them TV guys when you was a kid and they got the two little aerials sticking out the top of it, like hitting the eagles, and the picture was all. <laughs> That's how I was looking at my life and the world. All of a sudden, God's given me 3D HD widescreen. Wow! Everything's clean. Everything's fresh. Everything I touch, see, smell, hear, it's so exciting. So new. And God comes out and says, Born again. Born again. And it was that day I gave my life to the Lord. And the following week I was baptized. And Jay came with me. I don't know if you can get a picture of Jake. I hope you come before I finish my talk because he's a lad and a half. How are we doing for time, by the way? Okay? The next amazing thing that the way God spoke to me is how we channel how God speaks to you. It could be in the way of a, a dream, it could be a picture, it could be a song, it could be through your, your, your great pastor like Samuel, it could be through the scripture, prophecy. He can talk to you in so many ways. It's knowing how. To me to Father God. Like I said before, it's Lord, save me. Lord, I need this. Lord, I want that. Lord, 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 Lord. When do we stop to listen? Mm. When do we truly stop and listen to what God is telling all of us? Mm. We think we know what we want. God knows what we need. <laughs> There's a, an old hymn that I like to think about when I look at the old me and the new me. It's called Amazing Grace. And there's a verse in it that goes, that saved a wretch like me. And that's what it did. God saved a wretch like me. Now the next major thing in our lives, and it may seem a bit silly to some of you, so you non-dog lovers of all people, so non-pet lovers, bear with me from this one. For 15 years, we had a little Staffordshire Bull Terrier called Frank. And it was called Frank because that's who you rang up if you had a drug problem, so you can understand the background of this dog. You know where it was. 
So, uh, Frank was a true, trusted, loyal little pal to my wife, Debbie. When I worked nights, he was at Debbie's side. When there was trouble, he'd watch over and protect Debbie. He'd protect our home and our house. And he never judged. He was really how we ought to be. It doesn't matter what colour you are, what background you are, what clothes you wear, what sort of person you are. Ask Charlie. Oh, we'll feel the ones, mate. But anyway, this little dog was my guardian and Debbie's protector. And for 15 years, he watched over us all. But as the years went by, he started getting greyer and older. His eyes started to fail, his hearing went, and he struggled to walk around. And he had it tough a little bit, but he always tried to protect his home and his family. He was always there, regardless of his discomfort and his pain. And it got to the point where poor old Frank got a great big tumour on his right front leg, to the point where he, he couldn't jump on the settee, he couldn't walk very well. And I knew it was Frank's time to call the bed and have him to sleep. Which is difficult if you're a pet owner or after 15 years with this faithful friend. It tugs at your heart. Even a big tough bike like me on the sleep did. But that decision wasn't mine. It was Debbie's dog and her choice. And here's where the tough part comes. And here's where faith comes into it and listens to for Debbie to understand poor old Frank's discomfort and pain. But at the same time, Debbie was praying to God for a miracle to heal Frank. And here I was stuck in the middle, knowing that nobody lives forever, and this poor little God was in discomfort and pain. But if I had been put to sleep, that would have upset my wife and myself. But it tests and the faith. Where was the miracle? Where was Jesus when I wanted him? Why didn't he say that to loyal friend? He's got nobody in the So I'm praying to God for an answer. Well, funny enough, that answer came the following Sunday. At this time, I was riding with a motorcycle club called the God Squad. I don't know if you've heard of these, but they minister to the 1% or the Hells Angels and the Outlaw Bob scene. And a friend of mine who was a, a pastor was taking a service in church in Leeds. And we got, Debbie and I got an invite to go right over there and do the service with them, a bit, bit of fellowship. So that morning we got to, poor old Frank got this big bandage on his right front leg and his massive two balls. And uh, he must have knocked it or something on it, just pulled with the blood. And we got the kitchen floor that's tiled and the whole floor was red. Red. And this little dog was lately. Blood pouring out of him. Debbie crying her eyes out. I think, oh, what do I do? I rang the vet. The vet guided me through first aid. Told me it's not a main archery. It's the two minutes first. Don't worry. Repack it. You know, dress it. And keep it clean. Bring him in the Monday morning. Which I did. But I knew now Debbie would leave Frank. And she wouldn't come to the service with me. But something that day changed. Now what changed Debbie's mind? Or put it on her heart. But she decided to come to church with me. So we went up to Leeds. And when we arrived at the church, there was a lovely Indian lady called Ninda that met us and greeted us on the way in. And she sat with us through the service. And it was a really good service too. And at the end of the service, Linda stood up and walked to the front and says, I've got a prophetic word for somebody here in the audience. Now, nobody in that church knew me or my wife. My friend who was taking the service didn't even know I've got a dog. Linda turned around and says, the bandages have come off, it's time to let them go. Now, if that's not a message about poor old Frank suffering, and let's call the vet. Well, you can imagine on the way back, Debbie said anything. I dare say that I knew her heart was broken, but I knew she knew it was from God, but what got done to 
and that was it landing at the peace and at rest. That night, Sunday night, poor old Frank had a seizure. He was taken really ill. In the morning, Debbie came to me and says, call the vet, it's time. So I called the vet and because poor old Frank was in so much pain and discomfort, the vet came to our house. We knelt down with Frank on the kitchen floor, he was on his blanket. We even prayed to God to welcome him into heaven, the true and loyal friend that he would be. Frank passed away really peacefully in the arms of my wife. She cried, or kids. I cried, I don't mind admitting. A good friend, a real good loyal friend. Chris Lee hung in the corner. Two water and food bowls were in the kitchen, and even the impression in the pillow where he lay on the settee was still there. But he had gone. And this is like the Holy Spirit. You know when someone has passed. The shell is there, but the Spirit has gone. For those who haven't witnessed death, I hope you don't. But for people who have, you can all relate and understand what I'm talking about here. We are a spirit dwelled, we are a spirit based. It's from within that drives us. We've got arms and legs and organs and hearts and livers and kidneys and everything else we need to function. But what guides and controls and governs us all is what's in here. And that's what God communicates with us. So you can imagine what Debbie's going through. We had a week of crying and sorrow. But this is where God spoke to us all, all the time. I had this amazing dream of we're getting a new dog, and it's a little brown dog, and it's going to be called Charlie. No, oh, that was not the thing to say. There's only one dog, and we murdered him. <laughs> oh, my God. And he goes upstairs and cries more. Why, Lord? Why give me these messages? Why give me these images? I've upset my heart again, too. What am I doing wrong? So, like I say, I ran into the people who, who read Frank, they told me his, his father was a, a rescue dog. And uh, that's Frank. If you just hold that picture there for me, please. If you look here, just back up. Um, you can see there the tumor on his leg, on his right leg, or on his left. He couldn't move, he couldn't walk. Just keep that picture of Frank's face in your mind. That grey, old, wise dog's face. I'd like us to stop where I'm talking now. Could you play the, the little video? I've got a little video of it. It's so relevant and it's from a really talented artist. Some of you may have seen this before. I'm the star. He was there. He was there.
So you can see it, a talented, talented artist. But who of you saw Frank Space at the beginning? No? Yes? Remember that prayer to God to welcome Frank into heaven? The day after my friend sent me this video clip, not knowing I'd lost my dog, but knowing I was a Christian and would be impressed by a talented artist, I showed this to Debbie. That's how God speaks to you. Frank is with Jesus in heaven. He makes animals and dogs and people and everything else. He's with us. But he knew that message would bring comfort to my life. But because we had faith and we stood by what Jesus was telling us, it all comes good. But our story doesn't end here. Oh no. It gets a lot better. As I was telling you, I had this little dream about me getting a new dog. A little dog called Charlie, remember? Well, I rang this rescue people up and I made an appointment for them to come and visit us, but I never told my wife. Because I think she said that. So that Sunday morning, they said, at the door, I knew who it was. I'll get in, love. Open the door, but boy, did I get a shot. They didn't tell me they were bringing two of their own Staffordshire Terriers with them. As I opened the door, <laughs> straight into the living room and jumped all over my mind. She's going to look mad. She's going to thump me. She knows nothing about this. I walked into the living room ready for my apologies. And I looked there, and my wife was surrounded by these dogs, and she was hugging them, she was kissing them, she was petting them, the dogs' tails were wagging, and everybody was happy. But without that love, Debbie wouldn't have agreed to have another dog. So God, again, works his miracles. But it doesn't end there. Because the people at the rescue say, you don't pick your dog, we pick the dog for you. Hey, not sure about that. You know, I've got visions of a nice big bush, Staffordshire bull terrier that looks good on the with me in my leather jacket, that. Give it the old street cred, didn't it? Give me a little bone bang your leg and reach little skinny things. So what they do, they assess you. Have you got children that come round the house? Oh yes. Have you got a cat? Oh, funny enough, yes. So I've got that dog that gets on the cat and kids. Will you take the dog out in the car? Oh, of course. It's like a travel there. And then the questions and the forms we have to fill in you wouldn't believe. Right down to the colour of your socks and underwear, I think. I tell you, really in depth. So there's well, Mr. and Mrs. Colin, we have got a dog that's suited to you. But when you've got one, guess what? A little brown dog called Charlie. And if you look at him there, God has blessed him with two pure white angel wings right on his chest over his head. To remind me and Debbie every day of our lives when Charlie comes bounding in that God's love is there. And that's how you listen to God. So now I'll explain to you how we listen to God. And I've not given a testimony because this is far more important than the Spirit than listening to what I've done wrong in the past. But I do have a message. It's more than a message, it's an emotion. It's the best way of describing it. And I've been talking to Sammy now at work for over a week about going to see you guys. And I, and I wrote a speech. I even wrote a speech here. I've not even looked at it. God will give me the words to say. I know there's at least one, maybe two people here today. But a good people that jump through the hoops is the best way of putting it. And I'm sorry if I'm anyone to, to shame or I, I had to say the wrong thing here. I'm just saying what God's put in my heart. But they put everybody first and themselves last. There's a person I can see them now. They sat right on the edge of their seats. Wanting to come out here and wanting to be blessed. But there's something holding them back. What it is, I don't know. Whether it's that the other people go first. 
they're not interested in me. There's a lot more important people than me. But there isn't. Because until you fix and repair yourself with God's Holy Spirit, you can't help anybody. Fix and repair yourself. If you're broken, you cannot help anybody. But when you are walking in the light of God, you can do anything. Just remember that if I have again one word I describe God, it's love. Now if you're about hurdles and stripes, imagine me coming from a bike again. Going back, hey up lads, and they're there snorting their cocaine and drinking a beer, looking at the pornography, kicking somebody in the head outside the pool. I found Jesus. Oh, street, thank you. have been on the LSD again, mate. You know. No, I really am. And the trouble, and the pain, and the suffering. And I started walking in faith and witness and realised that I was part of it. I believe the guilt, the pressure, the burdens, the sorrow, the sadness. But one thing I've always remembered, God has paid the price. Jesus has paid the price for not only me, but for all of us. <laughs> Just remember what Jesus said as they laid him on that cross. Forgive not for they know not what they did. That were crucified into the cross. He was begging for God's forgiveness. Our humble. So if there's anybody, anybody today that's sat on the edge of their seats, I don't want to know your problem, I just want to bless you with the Spirit. You share that problem with the Lord. Hand over your problem to God. your issues and your problems at the foot of the cross, at the feet of Jesus. And let him deal with it. Because he's paid the price for all of us. May the blood of Jesus wash over you all and bless you. I thank you, Jesus, for letting me speak here today. Fellowship and kindness that you've showed me. I thank you for putting in touch with a great man like Pastor Samuel, a true brother and friend. I pray for every single one of you here today that God enters your life and blesses you, blesses every fibre of your body, fills you full of his spirit from head to toe.